Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session where we will be talking about democratizing data by creating common data models and configuration driven pipelines to enable AI platform. My name is Sharon Algai, and I am a senior manager of software development at BlockBot. Presenting with me is Cindy. Hi, I'm Cindy Modersed, AI architect at BlackBod. Today, I'm going to be giving you an overview of the problems that we were facing uh, and a brief description of our journey to build our data platform. Cindy will be going over our architectural decision, uh, the common data models that we created, what the configuration-driven pipelines are, and the transformation building blocks and the AI feedback loop. Before we get started, just a brief word about BlackBot and who we are. BlackBot is the world's leading cloud software uh, company powering social good. We serve the nonprofit and philanthropic uh, space globally. Let's get started by understanding the problems that we were facing. Uh, first, we have single tenant and multi tenant databases that span multiple products built on different technology stacks and hosted with different uh, cloud providers. Of course, all of our value is stored in those silos. Second, uh, this has led to similar domain entities being stored very differently by products. For example, a constituent may look like X in product one, Y in product two, and so on. Sometimes that translates to new fields, sometimes more radical departures, even though describing the same uh, core entity. Third, uh, through acquisitions and new development efforts over the years, we have actually compounded the problem by adding even more variety. Uh, then even within each product, uh, data entry inconsistencies exacerbates discrepancies in data sets. Uh, finally, it has uh, become painful to get access to all data and it takes a long time to get access to that data. So how do you scale getting new data sets in any sort of reasonable way? Almost always we are tied to some legacy product that has all the value. The question becomes, how do you get data in and out of um, those products and make it accessible to microservices deployed in the cloud so you can modernize and provide insight to customers? Looking at our journey, uh, we had a few um, data lake projects uh, that were scattered throughout the company. So we began uh, to build consensus towards uh, building a common data model uh, in a data platform. Uh, and being a Microsoft partner, we started off by leveraging existing Azure tooling such as Data Factory, USQL, and Azure Data Lake with a target of using um, as many PaaS uh, tools as possible. We wanted to keep it relatively simple and only do batch processing of data. Uh, finally, we picked a small project that required getting data from a legacy product that would allow us to test things uh, from end to end. Uh, this is what our initial architecture looked like. The data would flow in from our various data sources into Azure Data Lake storage and move from an initial transient zone by data standardization services to the raw zone. Uh, from there, the data would be moved uh, by data quality services to a clan zone and finally, data enrichment and modeling services would further enhance data in the enriched zone. The enriched data would be fronted by a data services API or be delivered to additional databases to finally be consumed by our products. It didn't take much time for us to find some flaws in our approach, which led to some pivots in our architecture. Uh, we found it uh, painful. Uh, to add new readers for different sources that were not supported, such as Avro and Parquet. Uh, there were some gaps in the Azure data tooling that we were using for our specific use cases. We realized that support for batch only um, processing was insufficient, and we wanted to have a single path for both uh, batch processing and streaming uh, of data. 
we need to have a compacted version of our records to recreate data sets from our legacy products in the data platform to make the data more consumable and useful for the rest of our processes. And finally, we needed to uh, use more standard, uh, standardized tools so we can hire data engineers more easily with the right expertise that can get up and running quickly. So let's look at our solution at a high level. Uh, we bring data together into a common data lake uh, that um, it, per data sovereignty region. We catalog data sets and transformations, making data easy to find, access, and manipulate. We are bringing out, uh, we're building out common data models so we, um, so new services can operate on data and not worry about differences in source systems. We set up and deploy configuration driven pipelines to support new transformations more easily. Uh, we develop tooling and infrastructure to allow teams to spin up their own Spark pipelines quickly and in a consistent way. We incorporated technology to match records across products and entries, creating a unique linking key. And um, we have infrastructure to support faster time to value by development teams. Uh, let's talk a little bit more about the different components of that architecture. Um, we leverage uh, Delta Lake as a storage layer on top of Azure Data Lake since it offers ACID transactions on Spark. Uh, the data catalog service captures metadata about our data sets, but it also captures metadata about the transformations that happen within the data platform uh, to more easily find access and manipulate that data. The lake authorization service was put in place to automate and better control uh, the, access to data sets within the data platform. The ingestion service streamlines the flow of data into our data platform. And of course, the output service standardizes the flow of data out of the data platform and back into our ecosystem. And finally, the async contract broker service uh, that seems a bit out of place, but it is our in-house message schema repository that uh, proactively prevents services from releasing breaking schema changes. So taking a closer look at the async contract broker, uh, traditionally this type of functionality would be an application platform service, but we saw an opportunity to get uh, developers to do the unimaginable. Uh, we got them to actually catalog and annotate their own data. Uh, by using the async contract broker, Developers get to enjoy code generation and peace of mind that they won't introduce breaking changes to their async messages schemas. And at the same time, the data platform gets to use the metadata they generate to populate entries in our data catalog. Another problem we solved with this service was that it, uh, it was hard to convince development teams to start sending us data, especially when we didn't have an immediate benefit we could offer them right away. Uh, but we already had a lot of services sending a lot of good data over async communication. Uh, and Service Bus made it very, very easy to add an additional subscriber. So we made a process that lets uh, us automatically subscribe to topics on a voluntary basis and uh, push all produced messages into the data platform. Uh, data that flows via this route is saved as a Delta table almost right away and cataloged as a separate entry in our data catalog, but with the same schema captured in the async contract broker. Therefore, everyone wins, everybody's happy, and we profit. Um, now that we've talked about our architecture and our journey, I'd like to turn it over to Cindy so she can uh, walk through how we leverage all this great data uh, that we have ingested into our data platform. Next one. Now that Sharon has walked us through our journey with the data 
platform architecture, I want to dive down a little into how we make this data easily available in a conformed and consistent fashion across all products and clients. We accomplish this by creating a multi-terabyte common data model. This common data model has a common defined structure, consistent naming uh, of tables, structures, and fields, consistent representation of common values, and consistent across all applications and application types. And it is integrated with our value added services. There. A common data model, our CDM, is a collection of objects. Each object represents an entity. In this case, the entire entity is a person. The object contains all the information about that person, including demographics, phones, emails, addresses, transactions, etc. These objects are stored as a row in a delta table. Here we see that the name field is a structure of all aspects of a name. This, the address, phones, and emails are arrays are, as there are multiple of each of one for one person. Let's look at the phones array. These are arrays of nested structures with collections of various information about the phone, including auditing information and the core phone information. If, if we dive down into the core information, we finally see the phone number along with all the other possible information around a phone number. There is an array entry for each phone type, home, mobile, work, etc. The input of the common data model is a stream of change events coming from thousands of relational tables, CSV table files, JSON, Parquet, across all of our products and across all of our clients. So we have the, the data is in all, in all forms, normalized data, denormalized data, structures, nested objects, uh, simple flat files, and comes from many different databases, SQL Server, MariaDB, Oracle, flat files, et cetera. Since we are processing streams of change events, we need to be able to update each change event without querying other tables, considering each source table can be billions of records. We need to be able to update a single field in a structure in a column in the common data model. To do that, we created a configuration-driven pipeline. How do we get the relational data-based cha changes events into this format at scale? We use the CDP, the configuration-driven pipeline. We designed a configuration-driven pipeline that has a common ID. A common ID is a requirement in any common data platform. It, it is required to allow our, your tables to merge into the common data model using the common ID. Destination data sets are defined by creating a map from the source table specified in the data catalog to the destination table. The map is created by a module that presents a list of available source tables and columns definitions provided by the data catalog and a list of valid transformations the CDP supports and a list of the available destination table fields. The metadata map is constructed to relate each source field to the destination table with a transformation if required to, to trans transform that into the correct schema. Spark structured streaming processes change events, interrogates the data catalog to determine lineage from this source table to all destinations. It receives this metadata map of source to, to destination and uses topological sort to resolve dependencies in the map generation. For each lineage, it applies transformations on each field specified in the map and then merges into the destination table. Transformations are basic building blocks that allow the pipeline to take any source schema and transform it into the destination schema. Our transformations, we've, we've um, oops. Can, our, We've decided that we've come up with a list of uh, transformations that are building blocks that if we, we can apply this, these six transformations to any input, any relational input, and be able to create the desired uh, common data model schema output. These, these six filters that we've defined are filters, uh, transformations are filters, views, one-to-one uh, -one with SQL transformation and lookup, where we take one field and we put it directly into the destination field, with possibly with a SQL transformation. 
one row to many rows where we take one row of data and input change events and uh, end up creating multiple rows to represent that data. And, and the, an example of this is when we get denormalized data, we want to break that up into multiple rows in an unpivot operation. Um, we have many rows to, a, to array in one column. This, this is a case where if we have phones, somebody's phones in multiple rows, their home phone in one row, work phone in another row, mobile phone in another row, this transformation will allow us to collect all of these phones for that individual up and put them into one column in the destination table. And the and final uh, transformation that we need in order to be able to transfer uh, transform any of these is aggregations, be able to do max, min, and other types of aggregations on this data. So with these six filters, we're able to uh, transform any relational data change event even, which is, uh, you, we just get a change event, which is a partial update to a record. And we, we can figure out through the map and through the, and use one of these transformations to successfully push it into the proper place in the common, uh, common data model. The filters are straightforward just, but the, we have pre-filters and transformation filters where the pre-filters will be applied to the stream as it's streaming in the change events. And the post, the transformation filter will be applied to the transformation once it's in process. And the view is, instead of writing to a destination table, we just create a view from the map. So we can map any combination of source and transformation to destination and create a view of that. So this allows us to, for example, an easy way for us to provide non-PII data for, from a, a huge table by just making a view that's, that hashes out the PII data and provides the rest of the data. So with these transformations, we're able to do uh, config, the configuration-driven pipeline can create any common data model or any destination model. In this demo, I will show how the configuration-driven pipeline processes incoming change events to update a multi-terabyte common data model. The change events in this example, here are their denormalized data for phones associated with a person, are processed by a Spark structured stream. When the change event arrives, the configuration driven pipeline calls the data catalog service to return maps to any destination data set that has a lineage from this source. This map specifies the source field, any transformation needed, and the final destination table field. When, when the configuration-driven pipeline processes all of these maps, it pushes the results up in updates of the terabyte common data model person in this example. So that's how the CDP receives these uh, change events over a stream, apply, applies the transformations, and pushes them into a, a, a delta table for the common data model. Now we will look more specifically at a, an example of what Spark API calls are used to do this. Here we will start with a uh, change events that are just name events, a very simple just name events. We have uh, for product A, we have person ID 1 and their first name and last name and ID 2 with their first name and last name. These change events come in, we interrogate the data, data catalog service and ask for any lineages based on these sources, and we return this map of source field, transformation, destination field, where you can see that the source field here is the ID, and we're going to turn that into a common ID in order to go into a common data model by simply applying a transformation that's a concat of the product date name, product A, with the ID, and then we'll push that into the destination field. So let, let's apply that map right now. And to apply it, it's very simple. We take our deltas that are our change events that came in, and we add a new column that's the destination column, column I, common ID, and we apply the transformation, the SQL transformation that was uh, specified, and we use the source input of ID. And so here we've simply created a new column of ID applying the transformation and we have our new column common ID with a, the new common ID which is product A colon 1 and product A colon 2 
at this point we'll process the remaining two or three in the map which are very simple as well if you remember the map is for for two and three it's just first underscore name goes to the destination of name dot first and la last underscore name goes name, name dot last so we apply that transformation and we can see that we have our change events that came in, we have our common ID that we've added, now we have this column name.first and name.last. At this point we have finished processing all of our transformations and the, the CDP is ready to just hand it off to the CDP finisher that takes any, all, any uh, combination of transformations and then cleans them up and, and pushes them. And the way we, what it does, the CDP finisher is responsible for uh, create structures. It will determine what destination structure columns were extracted and, and extract the nested fields necessary to, to fill in those destination structures. It also conforms the rest of the schema to the destination schema, setting up uh, fields as necessary and schema formats as necessary. And then it merges the this delta table the, uh, into the destination table. Um, as you can see here, name.first and name.last obviously look like structures, but there are two columns here. So the, the CDM finisher will take look at that and say, we want a nested field named name, and we and the subfields are going to be name.first and name.last. So to create that, to gather this structure, we simply do a new column, nested field of name. Um, so we're going to say new column of named name, and we're going to create a structure out of all of the, the columns that are subfields of that structure, in this case name.first and name.last. So if we run that, we will see that now we have a name column with structures underneath it, name.first. Um, there's a, then the, the part of the CDP finisher that looks to make sure that the schemas are the same as the destination schemas. We'll look at this and say the destination schema has a middle name as well so in order to set that up, we'll just simply add an, uh, that column to the nested columns, but we'll just make it a literal of blank. So this time, when we gather up our structures, we will gather them up with the fields that we're providing and the fields that are necessary to support the schema and the destination. At this point, that's, this is ready to be pushed up into the destination. Um, so we'll just select the destinations uh, part of the CDP finisher will just select the columns that are necessary to be pushed into the destination. In this case all we need is the common ID which we're going to join on and the name column because that's all we want to push into the destination. So to upsert this into the uh, common data model we will, uh, we will do a merge. We'll merge into the destination table and we will use the uh, common ID as the join on, so we'll join on common ID. And when it's matched, then we'll start, we have the CDP finisher has gone through and created an update list based on all of the schemas and ne uh, destination and source. And so in this case, it'll say destination named at first equals source named at first. But you can see we did not do the middle name because we're not updating the middle name because that did not come from the source. So we will just update the source fields within a structure that we have new data for. When it's not matched, when this is a, a new row to be added to the common data model, we will just simply insert common ID and name. And in that case, since we have set up this schema to be the proper schema for the destination table with middle name and, as well, the new, we will be able to insert this into the table um, with the proper schema. So with that, we have the, uh, desti the destination table is as we would want it to be, where we have the uh, structures nested nicely and a common ID. So that's it for the simple transformation processing. Now that we have a common data model that has all of the data across all the products and clients in, in a conformed way and in an easily accessible way where they can, where uh, data scientists or other product people can use our lake authorization service to simply request access to this table, or they can access a view uh, that has no PII in it. Now we are in a position where we can uh, start creating ML or AI feedback loops. 
we can have the full cycle of model development where the mod we can have a model that pulls data from our common data model and trains a model and then we deploy that model and it starts scoring some uh, new input data and we can turn that the result the, the labels that are, are created from that model back into the uh, into our system and, and the, that data will become available for the we can retrain our model on the on the labels that were created by the model itself and do a complete AI feedback loop. So when we look at it all together, data is now flowing from various products and services. It is automatically ingested into our data platform. We can transform the data through configuration driven pipelines and into common data models. Uh, data sets can then be leveraged uh, much more easily and generically to produce value to our customers. And finally, we have baked in feedback loops so we can uh, further iterate and improve. So how did we democratize data? Uh, we made it easy for our data scientists and engineers to access data sets from common data models uh, in a secure manner that limits our liability and maximizes the benefits uh, that we can draw from them. Uh, they no longer have to worry about the how, when, and where of getting access to data sets. Uh, they can more easily manipulate data, create insights, develop models, and output results to our ecosystems. Thank you very much for your time. We are ready to take your questions.